Hello, everybody, and welcome today. Uh, I wanted to follow up a little bit on two important issues uh, coming out of Pat's excellent outlook for corn and soybeans. And let's talk a little bit about trade, and let's talk a little bit about farm policy in the context of government payments. Okay. First, let's talk about trade. And you've seen in the news quite a bit about uh, Chinese purchases of U.S. corn and soybeans. So let's talk about, about one of the factors that might be behind this, and that is the phase one trade agreement signed with China on January 15th. Um, th there is within that agreement a target of $36.5 billion for 2020 calendar year, and that rising to $43.5 billion in 2021. These are big targets. The graph on the right shows you the relative size of this compared to 2017 base, and you're adding to that quite a large volume in the coming years should those targets be achieved. The values I want you to keep in mind are not based upon U.S. farm prices, nor are they based upon U.S. pork prices. They're based upon prices as received by China. But there is also, despite these large volume targets, large value targets, there's also a lot of discussion in the trade agreement that these purchases will be made at the market. So that is to say that it is trying to dissuade folks from thinking that the Chinese will buy no, from us agricultural pot products, no matter our competitiveness relative to other suppliers. So that's a common statement throughout the agreement. But there is some also some additional moves within the um, agreement to streamline trade administration, which would hopefully hopefully bring down costs and all else equal make us more competitive into the Chinese market. So that's an agreement si signed January 15th. But what we saw is early in the year, you heard a lot of discussion about record soybean purchases by the Chinese from Brazil. So why would the Chinese be buying beans from Brazil when they're trying to meet our phase one agreement? Well, part of that is, as you see on the left, this is from the 1819 crop year to the 1920 crop year, the one that just concluded. So these would, the 1920 crop year would be beans harvested last fall. As you can see, Chinese imports began to rise year over year. The Brazilian crop was larger and our own crop was much smaller based upon a significant area of prevent plant as we last year, we had a really wet spring. So you can see at least through the first half of the year on the right, that red line is the Brazil price over our own price. So the Brazil price was actually less than the US price for much of the beginning of the year. And that has shift as it often does as we approach our own harvest. We have, we have over time created a just-in-time delivery system for soybeans in the world, where for six months, the Chinese buy from us, and for six months, the Chinese buy from the Brazilians, each right after our own harvested, harvest. So now we are entering the phase where we are very price competitive with the Brazilians, and as a result, we've seen the Chinese make lots of buys. Okay, and the other part of this, is it purely a reaction to the phase one agreement? Well, I would also argue that what we've observed is a strong rebound in Chinese volumes of imports. The number you see there, so this is imports and crush. Uh, you see that in 1819, there was a sharp decline of both imports and crush as trade friction with the US ramped up. And at the same time, the Chinese hog herd was decimated by ASF. Okay, what we, see, what we saw in 1920 was a strong rebound in both crush and imports. Imports strongly exceeding crush as the Chinese began to rebuild stocks of soybeans. They keep uh, relative for them a modest amount of stocks of soybeans, but they did move in to rebuild them. And then we see that the forecast for 2021 is continued strong growth in crush within China almost back to the pre-ASF growth pace that we'd seen, we'd seen continual annual strong growth rates. So it appears that there has been a stronger than anticipated turnaround in the size of the Chinese hog herd. So a strong rebound pushing demand higher. So both the Chinese tr perhaps trying to meet phase one agreement and in addition, uh, seeing their feed demand rebound. Now, 
when I say, when we talk about sales that are in the news, those are sales that we're, we, we essentially call them on the books. Those are sales which are to be shipped. They haven't shipped yet. Not until they are inspected do we consider them shipped. So you can see here that the Chinese have been putting a lot on the books, getting buys arranged for our own harvest period. So we may expect large amount of what is on the books to actually be shipped as our harvest comes online. That would be the expectation. The danger of course is sales can be rolled or canceled. Uh, not until are they're on the ship are they really uh, a completed sale. Now it isn't just soybeans, it is also corn. We saw in July two of our largest uh, weekly sales uh, in history and both of those largest weekly sales in history to China, big volumes of sales to China for corn. Now, again, I think this is a combination of factors. The Chinese have a tariff rate quota on corn. That means uh, the first 283 million bushels can come in very cheaply. Everything over that pays a very high tariff. They have in the past not had a very transparent administration of that quota, which meant that it was often underfilled, okay? But they are on a pace so far to actually hit that quota. So will they fill the TRQs? It's looking like there's a much better chance this year of filling the TRQs than they have historically. Part of this driven by a change in the way they administrate the TRQs because of the WTO case loss to the United States. But also there is perhaps a need and it is perhaps driven by um, phase one. And at the same time, the Chinese may need feed but are having trade friction with the Australians limiting barley purchases. They've purchased sorghum from us to the standpoint they are probably uh, purchasing up a lot of our sorghum trade. And at the moment they still have tariffs on DDGs. So it is, it, it, uh, one might expect that they would fill much more of the tariff rate quota this year. Now, will they go beyond it? They can, they regularly go beyond their TRQ by expanding the, the, the the cheap quota um, by cotton. So they could do this quickly if they needed to. Not yet do those sales reflect that quota has been allocated beyond the TRQ. So in short, the through July so far this year, that light purple says what they've actually taken import of and the, the lighter orange is what they would need to do to make phase one. So are they likely to make phase one? No, it would be a Herculean task at this point to actually fully meet phase one. But that isn't to say that if a lot of those uh, sales on the books are actually converted to shipments, we could still have a very good year for trade for 2020. Okay, we would need to see a lot of those sales converted, but it is still possible to have a pretty decent trade year given what is on the books. We're behind the pace of basically any prior year through July. But remember, there's a lag. Even if it leaves today, it takes 30, 30 days or so, less than 30 a little bit, to get to China. So we've seen that begin to pick up. So let's talk about, so that's trade that's sitting out there that I think is one of the reasons that is providing price support. The other being, of course, the uncertainty about crop size. But there have also been COVID-19 impacts we've observed and continue to observe. This is from uh, an unpublished analysis we did to try and get a feel for how big COVID-19 impacts were. A decline of $15 billion on crop receipts, $32 billion on livestock receipts, some of those offsetting, so lower livestock receipts. Those livestock producers also benefit a little bit from lower commodity prices, so lower feed prices, but you end up with about a negative $30 billion of COVID impacts on net farm income. What's happened is the government stepped in and provided CFAP money to offset some of those commodity price losses. So including livestock, specialty crops, row crops have stepped in and made that allocation. And the government has already indicated a willingness and a program that we'll get details on call, uh, called Loosely CFAP 2. Uh, and that announcement should be coming out this month, the details of it but the secretary has already announced such a program. And I think what they're looking for when they think about CFAP2 is what the expectations are for farm income for fiscal year 21, all right? 
We see that nine, uh, uh, farm income for 2020 is roughly equivalent to 2019, in part due to those large payments from the US government. And I think that folks look forward and see a decline in farm income and that we may see a program which targets 2021 farm income, commodity prices, and doesn't reflect the same unmarketed grain that the first CFAP payment did. That would be my expectation. So again, these are two programs that, uh, uh, two important factors in the marketplace that are affecting uh, commodity prices and farm income. And I hope you enjoy the rest of your day.